Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I want to, uh, my name is Carl Gershman, um, and I want to welcome everyone to this very important meeting on uh, the situation uh, in, Ethi in Ethiopia. Um, I think, as everyone knows, uh, last week was uh, April the 2nd, um, was the uh, first anniversary of uh, the inauguration of uh, Abiy Ahmed as the Prime Minister in Ethiopia, um, which was a kind of a, in our view, uh, an opening, a breakthrough for the, uh, for the end of a dictatorship and the possibility for democracy. And since that happened, almost immediately, uh, he started introducing some very important historic changes, releasing tens of thousands of uh, political prisoners, uh, beginning a process of making peace uh, with Eritrea, freeing the media, taking steps to prepare for the first uh, free elections, which will be held next year, and welcoming back uh, to Ethiopia groups that had been banned by the previous government and leaders uh, who had been forced into exile. One of them, uh, Berdekam Medexa, who was a fellow here at the NED in 2010. And uh, I could see when I first met uh, Berdekam um, how hard it was in Ethiopia. Um, she had been really uh, damaged by uh, her being in prison and so forth and could see her recover. Uh, and begin to blossom when she was here. And then the fact that she has now returned uh, to become uh, the commissioner for elections, overseeing the election process, is just, again, uh, a remarkable indication of the changes uh, that are taking place uh, in Ethiopia. Yet, as I, I think we all know, there are just enormous dangers uh, when you have a situation uh, after a long period of dictatorship, which opens up in this way, uh, in a way, the new freedoms unleash uh, the waves of uh, frustration and dissatisfaction that had been pent up uh, for the period of, of, of repression. And as we know, in addition to the very serious economic problems that the country faces, there is also very deep-seated uh, ethnic divisions. This is a country of over 80 ethnic groups, um, and uh, there's, been, there's been conflict. And as many as 2.9 million people are now internally displaced as a result of these conflicts. So these are very, very uh, serious problems. And uh, the NED, uh, from the very beginning, um, has taken uh, the view that we have to uh, uh, act urgently to assist this transition. And I want to congratulate Tiffany Lynch and our uh, Africa team for the actions that they've taken, not only to get a serious and significant grants program going, but also to try to mobilize other, others to become effective. In terms of, the, of what the NED has done, um, we've already made, and you know, we're not a big donor agency, and we don't, uh, we're, we're trying to mobilize the big boys, uh, which has not been easy, but we've, we've put in $3 million in grants to our own four institutes. One of them, the Center for International Private Enterprise, which is working to strengthen the capacity of a network of uh, society, uh, chambers of commerce, civil society groups, business associations, entrepreneurial organizations to engage in a dialogue with the government on the kinds of economic policies that are needed for the country's recovery and economic growth. Our Solidarity Center has been working with the Congress of Ethiopian uh, trade unions and we're absolutely delighted uh, this morning uh, to have with us the president of the uh, Congress of uh, the Ethiopian Confederation of Trade Unions, Kasun Folo, and we're looking forward to his remarks uh, today. Our National Democratic Institute has been conducting focus groups around the country to try to inform the government, really, of what, what's on people's minds that would you know, help in, in moving the process forward. And our International Republican Institute uh, is working uh, to mobilize youth uh, to facilitate their participation in the election process uh, that's beginning to get underway. Uh, we also make uh, direct grants to Ethiopian organizations to rebuild civil society, to promote conflict resolution and human rights, to revive the independent media, to generate po policy discussion, to prepare for elections, and to reform the security sector and support overall 
national reconciliation. Uh, it has been difficult, and I want to be very frank about this, it has been difficult to mobilize the international community. We're deeply concerned here about the inertia of the international community and the fact that large donor agencies may have funds ready for 2020, but what's really critical is what happens in, in 2019. Uh, and things could easily come unglued very quickly in Ethiopia, and it's absolutely urgent that people act quickly. And so in addition to this meeting this morning and convening donor organizations, we're even planning uh, a major meeting. We fu we've funded a, a group in Ethiopia to organize a major uh, international conference uh, in June, uh, probably the third week in June, when it would give the government an opportunity to uh, to lay out its plans for reform and to have the international community uh, not only hear that, but then also have uh, working groups on specific problems which, which can begin to break down exactly what has to be done in each of the different sectors of the reform process, which could be critically important. And hopefully this will accelerate the engagement of the donor organizations, which has been lagging uh, until now. We'll also be publishing in our Journal of Democracy in the July issue uh, an article on um, uh, Ethiopia's quiet revolution, and the co-author of the article is one of our speakers this morning, Yosef uh, 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 Bedwaza. So we're really delighted with that. I've read the article. I'm going to recommend it to you. Maybe even if you're lucky, Tiffany will give you a pre-publication copy, because it's really an excellent uh, piece uh, summarizing the whole situation. I believe that the world has an enormous stake in what happens uh, in Ethiopia. If it fails, if this transition fails, you know, there'll not only be a return to uh, dictatorship and violence uh, and ethnic conflict, but uh, there'll be a, tr a tremendous number of, of, of refugees, uh, and it will really destabilize not just the region, but, um, but beyond the region. But if it succeeds, and if it, it could become a model of success that uh, for a successful democratic transition in a multi-ethnic and divided society that, in my view, given the nature of Ethiopia and the size of Ethiopia, will not just be a benefit to the people of Ethiopia, but would be a model uh, for democratic transition in a multi-ethnic society and give encouragement and hope to people all over the world. So our discussion this morning, I think, is an important opportunity to review what's happening there. And I, and I want to thank everyone for being here. Thank Tiffany and the Africa team for uh, its leadership on this issue. And, and uh, we'll begin the program now. Tiffany. Carl for his introductory remarks, and um, I want to thank our panelists for coming here today. Some uh, right from Ethiopia, some more recently from Ethiopia, and I want to thank you all for joining us today in person and those who are online. Thank you. As Carl mentioned, it's just been a little over a year since Prime Minister Abiy was inaugurated, and it's been quite a whirlwind of a year. Um, but let's just think back to where we were a year ago. Just a little bit over a year ago, Prime Minister Halle Mariam announced his resignation. And I think for many of us, we were nervous. We were a little unsure of what would happen. There had been some release of political prisoners, but at the same time, there was an imposition of another state of emergency. What would a new leader mean for Ethiopia? Would it lead to a little bit more opening? Would it lead to further repression, potentially destabilizing the country and the region? And so for weeks, Ethiopians and Ethiopian observers tightly watched what was happening within the ruling party coalition, the PRDF. And we scrutinized to see who would they select. And when the announcement of Abiy Ahmed came, I think everyone was very pleasantly surprised, and I would emphasize surprised. And then for the rest of the year, we've been continued to be surprised at some of the reforms that Carl has announced and mentioned, the continued release of political prisoners, the welcoming back of political parties, exiled party leaders, exiled journalists, human rights activists the initiation of legal reforms to open up civic sector space, 
a promise to privatize the economy and increase industrialization, a new foreign policy agenda that is reforming and changing the dynamics in the Horn of Africa, the decision to have gender parity within his ministry and to appoint senior human rights activists to, to different senior government positions. However, as Carl mentioned, this transition and this transformation does not come without challenges. And in a way, we are some, a similar place than where we were just a little over a year ago. We're at an important period in the transition. Will we continue to see openings? But how do we continue to see challenges? And how will Prime Minister Abiy and the government address these challenges to continue to move forward a democratic transformation process in the country? How will it address ethnic conflicts and ethnic tensions? What is the role of security in it? What is the role of social media? How will the government tackle these two different challenging institutions? Can the Ethiopian economy sustain its growth? The World Bank estimates that the Ethiopian government will need to provide two million jobs per year to keep pace with population growth. And connected with this are great demographic challenges. 41% of the country is under 15. 28% is between 15 to 29. These youth help lead the revolution, help lead this change to Ethiopia. How will the government not just provide them jobs, but provide them a platform to engage in this democratic process? The political sector. A lot of questions remain about the structure and the outlook of the EPRDF. What will it look like within the next year? Other political parties returning and those who remained in Ethiopia. What will happen to them? What is the relationship within the EPRDF but with those outside? And how will all this play with the legal reforms, the political reforms, an upcoming election? And the legal reforms that are ongoing. They are moving simultaneously fast and slow. And so with us today, we have a terrific panel to look at some of these issues, to address some of these questions. And I think to help move forward the discussion to help address these challenges, to think through what can we do over the next year, the next couple of months, to really um, help for, move forward uh, bringing full democracy to Ethiopia. Our first panelist will be Kasun Folo, who is president of the Confederation of Ethiopian Trade Unions. We look forward to hearing from Kasun about the role of workers in this new transition period, in the political environment, and political reforms. Following Kasun, we have Yosef Badazwa, who is senior program officer for Ethiopia at Freedom House. And he will provide insights into the ongoing political changes and dynamics in the country and what these mean for security and legal reforms. Following Yosef, we'll have Obang Metho, who is the executive director of the Solidarity Movement for New Ethiopia. He was recently traveling in Ethiopia throughout the country, many villages, many states. And he met and held dialogues for five months to understand and talk with people about the, the ethnic conflicts, the tensions, their desires, their wishes, their recommendations for the government going forward. So I think he could provide a, a terrific insight to those of us who want to hear more about what people are thinking outside of Addis. And then our closer will be Sefa Asfa, who is president of the African Civic Leadership Program, and he will speak to the state of the legal reforms, not just the status of them, but what are their challenges to implementation, but also the opportunities for civil society and how they can engage and promote democracy in Ethiopia. So with that, I'll turn it over to Kasim. Thank you very much. Uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Kasim Volo. I'm the president of the Confederation of Ethiopian Trade Unions. Uh, I representing more than 650,000 workers. Uh, Confederation of Ethiopian Trade Unions is sole independent uh, trade union. First of all, I would like to thank American Solidarity Center for inviting me to this uh, discussion. Then as the president of the Confederation of Ethiopian Trade Unions, I bring with me a fraternal uh, greeting is from all Ethiopian working community. Uh, then uh, after I say this uh, few remarks, let me brief you about situation of Ethiopia or the current state. Ethiopia is the second populous uh, country on this uh, continent of Africa. Now almost this is uh, around 110 
uh, a million population. So what's happened in Ethiopia often sets a standard for things to come in the region. Ethiopia, along with the surrounding countries, uh, they form what we know as the Horn of Africa for a long time have been, have struggled to break away from autocracy, autocracy rule, one sole uh, political parties, not only in Ethiopia, in uh, different uh, countries around the sub-region. Uh, now changes has come to Ethiopia. Change has come to my homeland in the form of uh, political shift and governance to an opening democratic space. The transition from singular political party to a more open political uh, process and the leadership was marked by the election of the new Prime Minister, Dr. Abiy Ahmed, who has executed historic milestone in governance. This is what we are, we are observed as the trade union. Uh, <coughs> the freeing of all political prisoners and allowing opposition groups, including groups in exile, to peacefully operate with the country for the first time. Not only that, there is a, um, uh, it was taken uh, a lot of reforms by reforming the defense, uh, the security, the federal police, and so on. Also, there is some uh, reform in the uh, uh, Supreme Court. So this uh, change, uh, almost now 50% uh, of the cabinets are women. Even to this day, much of Ethiopia is uh, still divided based on ethnic, which gives our trade union say to and an even greater role in the future of our democracy because say to is the largest multi-ethnic civil society organization in the country. In our organization, there are multi-ethnic uh, 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 members from every ethnic uh, group. So we cannot support or we cannot oppose one ethnic group as a trade union organization. We re are respecting all the ethnic group, but we cannot uh, support only one ethnic group or two or three ethnic group. <coughs> Setu has a presence in both urban and rural workplaces throughout the country, bringing together an ethnic, ethnically diverse group of citizens who stand together to achieve common goals. This, the other thing is the Setu structure is not following the government structure. Our structure is we are following the geographical structure in our uh, country. So we have eight branches in all of the country by dividing by the geographical area, not ethnicity based or uh, language based. <laughs> Setu seeks to empower not only the working people of Ethiopia, but also to empower the community at large to take on a greater role in the political process on the local and the national level. Uh, Setu is sole national center, so we have members in every region, in every waradas. So <coughs> if we change our members, if we change our uh, members and uh, their families, so we can change other uh, community. <laughs> so we are changing the all co the all working community, not only our members. So at the end, why we are here today as the uh, Confederation of Ethiopian Trade Union? Uh, <laughs> to build the solidarity with African labor uh, movement through a, a common goal of empowering workers, building democracy for the bottom, from the bottom up to uh, top, instead of from top to down. 
because if you are change the whole society culture, you cannot get democratic leader or democratic party. Because uh, if the community is changed, so the leaders and the political parties may be uh, changed. That we what we believe to exchange best practices with multicultural and multi-religious USA membership based organization engage in public policy advocacy so it can inform non-polarizing approaches and the strategy appropriate to the current Ethiopian context. In order to more effectively contribute to the continued opening of democratic space in Ethiopia and the more effectively encourage public policy advocacy that's beyond ethnic and religious lines, the Confederation of Ethiopian Trade Unions say to delegation seeks to engage with US trade unions and civil society organizations across the sector. We came here to share our struggle as well as learn important lessons from the struggle of the past. Also, we seek build international support beginning with some of, with, with some of our uh, most uh, key supporters right here in the USA. We ask you to stand with us in our fight to maintain a more democratic Ethiopia. Now is the time to invest in a diverse membership-based civil society organizations such as Confederation of Ethiopian Trade Unions to strengthen and build on democratic gains achieved in Ethiopia as the U.S. evaluators future aid to Ethiopia. Let me mention some challenges in our country today, uh, maybe it is some challenges to sustain the positive economic growth. Uh, there's uh, uh, poverty, unemployment, lack of uh, good governance. Maybe good governance is uh, better at the top level. Now the challenge is at the grassroots level, uh, there's a lack of good governance. Uh, unemployment, uh, inequality, uh, is internal conflict here in the Zer. Uh, since it is change, there are some people that are resisting the change, so they are creating conflicts here in the Zer. Uh, the other is uh, lack of democratic culture. So, in our uh, National Museum of Ethiopia, we hold the oldest human fossil known as Lucy. Lucy is not just mother of Ethiopia, but she is mother to us, all that just making Ethiopia the family home to humanity. So we all can take ownership in the process of empowering workers and uh, ensuring democracy across the country across the region and ultimately across the globe. So I'm talking as a trade unionist. I'm not a politician, I'm not activist. Just to show what is the uh, reality on the ground in Ethiopia. So I thank you. Thank you, Castor Hoon, for telling us a little bit about how uh, the union and workers can can demonstrate best practices in democracy, local democracy, and, and pluralism. Um, Yosef? Uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to start by thanking the National Endowment for Democracy for uh, organizing, uh, as always, very timely and important uh, discussions on Ethiopia. and. Uh, Thank you also for uh, inviting me to be a part of it. I, I, I've been asked to, to speak on, on the major political developments over the past year, uh, and also uh, the challenges and uh, the way forward uh, in assessing uh, this 
uh, big political developments and how uh, they will be impacting uh, longer term uh, democratic trajectory for, for the country and uh, uh, frankly for uh, the entire Horn of Africa region. So I, I'll, I'll just uh, limit my, my remarks to, uh, to what I think is that the, the macro level uh, political uh, reform initiatives that are been uh, that have been undertaken by by the new administration and then uh, uh, suggest uh, what what I think would be uh, a way forward in terms of solidifying uh, this uh, really encouraging initiatives and uh, giving them the institutional and legal foundations that would uh, lead uh, the transition and put it in, in a more uh, stronger uh, uh, stance. So uh, I, I think a key uh, frame of reference uh, in assessing uh, what took place over the past year uh, by way of uh, reform measures would be uh, uh, looking at what uh, the country have been going through uh, over the past three, four years. Uh, we had uh, I think a situation, a very dire situation where uh, a government which was uh, fast losing uh, its ability to control uh, relentless anti-government protests uh, and uh, what is left of its uh, legitimacy uh, despite unleashing massive uh, security force forces including the military uh, despite declaring two states of emergency and uh, trying to contain uh, the, the growing demand for uh, uh, democracy uh, and uh, meaningful representation by people of very diverse uh, origin, uh, the, the government, the ruling party, uh, was, was losing uh, uh, that uh, by the day. So uh, we had uh, a situation where uh, the economy was stagnating and people have started uh, talking about uh, an all-out civil war and uh, a state collapse. Uh, so we have a situation also uh, uh, towards the end, a party, a ruling party that has been in power, that has been monopolizing power for uh, over 25 years, uh, looking at self-preservation by allowing uh, some form of uh, reforms initially uh, and that paving the way for uh, elements of reform within the party uh, to actually capitalize on what is taking place outside to push uh, for change within, within the party. So uh, I think uh, the changes that the party uh, was forced to make at the end of the day uh, provided an opportunity uh, or some, some sort of relief time to, to avert the, the really uh, impending uh, crisis that would have led to a, a very serious uh, situation for the country. So uh, the, the major uh, political uh, steps that have been taken uh, since the new administration came to power have been, I think, fairly publicized. This is ranging from uh, the release of thousands of political parties uh, in making peace with Eritrea uh, and inviting back uh, outlawed political groups and uh, trying to start uh, a political process that is uh, increasingly uh, emphasizing uh, trust uh, and trying to mitigate the really polarized nature of uh, Ethiopian political discourse. So uh, the transition uh, is really far from settled, uh, uh, but I think it still offers an opportunity to, to build more uh, and stronger uh, diversity of ideas that could uh, lead uh, Ethiopia to be a, uh, uh, an example in political and democratic experiment uh, 
for the Horn of Africa. So I, I, I see I, uh, three big phases in, in, in the reform uh, initiatives that the government is trying to do. Uh, the, the first one is, I think, maintaining stability. Uh, this has been uh, proving really quite a challenge. Uh, uh, there is an uh, unprecedented level of uh, ethnic and communi communal violence. Uh, I, I think uh, it's understandable that this was uh, an expression of a pent, out, pent up grievances over decades uh, and also to an extent the government's ambivalence uh, in terms of uh, exerting its uh, coercive power. Uh, I think in, as in many uh, transitions that project uh, some, some sort of democratic inclination, uh, the, the dilemma the government is having is between uh, using at times its legitimate power to, to proactively uh, prevent uh, major uh, ethnic and political violence versus uh, the image, the optics of being seen as uh, using uh, excessive force. Uh, I think that has uh, its historical origins, but I think uh, there is this uh, ambivalence affecting uh, the government's effort to maintain uh, peace and stability. Uh, there is a, a massive uh, flow of arms uh, in, in the country, again, uh, with an unprecedented uh, proportions, and there is uh, uh, a new and old groups of unregulated, unregulated armed uh, groups uh, that are both within the regional government's uh, purview, but also operating uh, outside of uh, this uh, governmental control. So I think these are, this is uh, uh, proving to be uh, a, a very critical challenge uh, for the government. And I think the other step is setting up uh, the institutional and legal uh, foundation uh, that would lead uh, the country into, uh, that, that would lead the transition into a more uh, settled uh, democratic order. I think in, in this uh, case, uh, there have been marked examples, I think remarkable uh, steps that are taken uh, and uh, that, would have, that would really uh, have implications for uh, uh, what the government uh, may be able to do uh, if successful. I think if we look at uh, the, the change uh, that is taking place at the National Board of Elections, uh, I think uh, if, if we look at uh, the, the, the changes that are taking place uh, at the Supreme Court and the, the effort that is uh, being made to institutionalize uh, the nomination and appointment of the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission and uh, the legal reform process, most importantly, I think, uh, are uh, uh, really positive steps. And I think the third one is uh, preparing and conducting uh, elections. I think there's a lot of uncertainty around that and it requires very multi-layered uh, preparation uh, and really a trust building work, but uh, I, I think uh, this could go on well. I think after uh, completing these uh, major phases, I think that the ideal situation would be setting up a new government that would have stronger legitimacy and more uh, acceptable representation, which would uh, be able to address uh, more fundamental uh, questions uh, such as uh, constitutional reform, which has been a very recurring uh, issue uh, that is uh, dragging uh, transitional political conversation at this moment. So I think uh, uh, I will quickly uh, move uh, to, uh, I think, the, the, the key indicators that I would say. I think in, ter in terms of uh, uh, taming the, the polarization in Ethiopian political conversation, in Ethiopian political debate, uh, the fact that the, 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 the over 100 uh, political parties uh, uh, sitting down trying to negotiate their way into a center, into a political uh, 
settlement that, that is acceptable to uh, m at, at least most of them is uh, really encouraging. I, I think uh, a, a, a reflection of that is uh, the signing of this covenant by over 100 parties last month. It, it is not a binding document. It has no legal force, but I think as, as a symbol of political step, uh, I think it shows that there is a degree of phase on the part of the major political actors in the country that uh, this uh, process uh, is there to stay. Uh, uh, I think another key indicator would be uh, whether or not the government will be able to uh, carry out the census, which is both a requirement, uh, uh, a mandatory as such, uh, and also a trust building exercise uh, on the part of uh, the government and the, the, the political actors uh, uh, when trying to uh, build a foundation uh, leading to uh, an effective transition. Uh, I, I'll just say a few words by way of next steps. I think uh, the, the, the priority would be uh, restoring phase, uh, the government restoring phase in its ability to govern. Uh, that starts with maintaining uh, peace and uh, ensuring security for citizens. And also, uh, by way of uh, improving communications, I think moving beyond uh, crisis communication and focusing more proactive and policy engagement. Uh, and also, uh, more critically, again, I think engaging the youth and explaining to the youth uh, what uh, the peace and political reform dividend is. Uh, and also getting, most importantly, again, getting the reform conversation out of Addis and out of the big fancy venues in Addis and taking them to the local level and having ownership at the, sit at the level of the citizen, I think. Uh, those are uh, the, the major remarks I have. Thank you. Thank you, Yosef. Thank you, um, and that was a terrific transition to Obank. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, everybody. Uh, my name is Obang Meto, and I would like to really to thank the NDA for uh, you know, having this very, very important uh, discussion on Ethiopia, and I think Carol put it very well. Anyone who cares about the humanity should care about what's going on in Ethiopia. And I will be speaking to you as a human rights activist, and also does in as Ethiopians, a problem happened in Ethiopia, to the Western media, something happened to Ethiopian. To me, something happened to my family and to the people that who are close to me. So, going back to this, let me say a little bit about who I am. I have only 10 minutes. I've been working as a human rights activist for the last almost 15 years. It happened in 2003 when there were a massacre that took place in the Gambela region in southwest of Ethiopia, where I come from originally, where 424 people were killed, but were killed by the National Defense Force. At that time, when the human rights abuse took place, this place is a very marginalized area. People were not making much of awareness about it, so I did get involved. We set up an organization an ethnic-based organization called Anyuak Justice Councils, because the group who were targeted was an ethnic group called Anyuak. We did work with that. Later on down the road, we learned that the problem why these people were targeted, because they were not seeing us, you know, one people. The humanity was lost. And we saw that the problem of Ethiopia the justice will not come to Gambela unless it comes to all Ethiopians. We realize that the failure of Ethiopia's system, because Ethiopia is the only country in the world where the constitution of the country is being named under nation nationality. Americans everywhere say that we the people, and Ethiopia say we the tribe. The people in Gambela, when they were targeted, they were targeted based on their ethnicities. And I found that that was the problem. To root that problem out, we thought that to set up an organization, and that organization is the name that you see in front of me, Solidarity Movement for New Ethiopia. Someone may say, why New Ethiopia? 
not changing the map, not changing the flag, but changing the thinking of Ethiopia. And also there in Ethiopia, there where the humanity come before ethnicity or any other difference, because we come to this world with no language, no religion, nothing, just human. And to be a human that your right has to be protected, because none of us will never be free until we are all free. Since that time, we've been advocating this since 2008. And we speak up when injustice is committed to anybody in Ethiopia. We don't care what their ethnicity are. We don't care what their political affiliation are. By being a human, it's enough. The organization has three ideas. Advocacy, awareness, human rights. So Ethiopia, in the last three months, three years, there were protests. People were coming out of the studio and are protesting. Finally, by luckily enough, Dr. Abi came in. When Abi came, like most of the Ethiopian, I was the first to support him. I didn't support him because of his ethnic group. I didn't support him because of his political ideology. I support him because he stood up for the rest of all Ethiopians. And I gave him the reason of the doubt, say that, you know, these men will do the right thing. Yes, he did. He released political prisoners. He signed agreement with the neighboring countries. He allowed all the political opposition leader who had been accused of being a terrorist to come back home. Most of the Ethiopians went home to celebrate, but we went home to do the work. Our team went to Ethiopia with a name called Team Ethiopia. We call the name Team Ethiopia because today we are living in a country where the Ethiopian really question if they are really Ethiopian, even though they live in that map, in the map of that country. We went there as a team, and then when we went, we went especially to almost seven regions of Ethiopia out of the nine. The number one thing we did was to go to Gambela region where I came from. We met with the president of Ethiopia, who said that the real source of the problem in the country, especially, is ethnic violence. So we went there to give a hand for the right and for the well-being of Ethiopia. So we decided that one of the areas that we need to focus on, the youth, because the university become the battlegrounds where the kids kill each other. Second, the elders, because elders are the wisdom, the people that we know that listen to. Both, most of the African justice have been, not been done in a room with a table, but it's been done under the trees. Most of the dispute that have been resolved in Africa has not been resolved in a courtroom, but under the trees, because those people do matter. We went and listened to them. Third is religious leaders. And of course, we met with the political leaders. While we went there, while we were in Addis Ababa town, there's a problem in a place called Buraya outside Addis, where a certain ethnic group were targeted because of their ethnicity. Just to name a few places where we went. We went to Gambela. We went to Anamor and Guragar area. We went to Bayardar in Amara region, Gondor, Debrebrand, uh, Awasa in the south, Shashamene, Walkete, Jigjiga in Somali, Arbaminchi in the south, Afar regions, Deradwa, Waldia, Arar, Wallo, Dase, and Gambela. And the founding that we got in those places the change we have in Addis did not trickle down to the grounds. We found that there were some places where really people were not feeling secure. People live in fear. Especially in other when we were there. We went also there in visit the Ethiopian there who are being displaced. Today in the world we have more internal displaced people in Ethiopia than anywhere else in the world. Don't ask me why they were not displaced because of earthquake, natural disaster. They were displaced because short-sighted, lack of imagination, political ideology, which I call tribalism. People who used to live together, they kill together. They kill each other. So when we talk to elders, the finding we heard was there's invisible hands. People from the previous regime don't want change. They don't want reform. When we went to school, we talked to some of the kids. A two kids will fight. It will lead to ethnicity. The school will be closed down. Because what has been 
planted. A farmer harvests what they have grown. Ethiopian are harvesting what has been planted 27 years ago. What I call ethnic political ideology, tribalism in a simple form. That did not change. So I went and talked to some of the university, Jigjiga University, Gondor University, Arba Minch University, Waldia University, Wallo University, Afar University, Gambela University, the Brebran University. All of these places, when we went there, some of our kids, even some kids say that when we come here, we are less tribal. When we go back, we are more tribalists. And the above all, maybe sound be grim. I am very worried about Ethiopia today than were before. Why? A change has come, and Abby brought that change. But that change had stalled somehow. Today, if you look at it in Ethiopia, there are some places where a political leader will go to have a political party rally, and some young men will come out carrying a gun to protest against that. There's a dispute over a land, and a young man will stand outside with a machete. That machete is not to cut a tree. That's what I mean that we lost the humanities. And to change that it required critical thinking. And I'm glad that we are talking about this. Most of Ethiopians are seem, and Carol put it very well, most of Ethiopians seem to be afraid to speak about this because we don't want to criticize the great things that Abiy has done. No. We have to speak up. One way or another, we will deal with it later on. We have to talk about the elephant in the room, what I call ethnic politic, an ethnic hatred politic. There are some group who used to be abroad, living in the U.S., in subsidized U.S. house, going to Ethiopia, telling people you don't belong to this area. Calling some of them settlers. Ethiopian, when we come here after five years, we are an American citizen, we are not settlers. And these issues seem to be not being addressed. Yes, Abi has appointed Chief Justice to be a leader. Yes, he appointed Freedom Fighters to be in you know, election committee. Yes, he appointed more women to the parliament. Yes, but that's not enough. To me, the meaningful reform has not begun. A meaning reform, what I mean by that is number one, constitutional reform. Number two, institutional reform. Unless we deal with this, changing a driver doesn't make really the car to go. Especially in Africa, we know that the roads are terrible. And when we get a driver that really terrible, people will get so frustrated and they will start screaming. It's not about changing the drivers. Making sure that we have a car that functions effectively. And what are those parts of the cars? Institution independent judiciary, independent militaries, to, um, to reform this constitution and change these two things. Unless a meaningful reform come, Ethiopia is going to collide. And if it does, the problem will be just unimaginable. When I was there, there was a problem between Romia and Somalia and Benish and Kol. Because of the population within three days, two days, 93,000 people were internally displaced. Imagine if that problem get out of control. What would be in humanitarian disasters? And so that's why I said it matters. As someone like me who are promoting, advancing, fighting for the human right, not the tribal right, I would rather be isolated by not speaking up, telling the truth, than ignoring my conscience. So within that in mind, I know that I have one minute left. Yes, Ethiopia, what happened, people view it as miracles. But now this country have anxiety. People are afraid. They don't know what will happen tomorrow. So it seems to be that the prime minister is trying his best, but the future of the country doesn't depend on a one man. I'm not begging the Western and say they'd come and do this. But to the Ethiopian that I will talk to them. And my message to the Ethiopian is simple. The problem of Ethiopia has been created by Ethiopian. It can only be solved by Ethiopian, but you need other people to come to your site. In that case, the elephant in the room, we should talk about it. 
those who are promoting ethnic, ethnocentric groups need to know where the ethnic politics was practiced, Yugoslavia, Rwanda, you name others. And that should not come to Ethiopia. And Ethiopian has the work to do. And also that we, the Western, have the work to do. The media, social justice groups, we need to speak up and say that what I've is, yet is good, but not good enough. We need to do more. Our humanity has no boundary. Thank you. Thank you, Obang, for reminding us of the urgency of this period. Sefa? Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Tiffany. I mean, the, the disadvantage of being the last speaker is uh, you run out of, out of ideas because most people have already discussed the ideas. But I mean, uh, I'll be talking about the, uh, the legal reform initiative, uh, you know, as it has been uh, well said by all of the panelists. Uh, after the coming to power of uh, Prime Minister uh, Abiy Ahmed uh, and his uh, new administration, they, they initiated uh, a sweeping reform across uh, political, economic, uh, uh, and legal sector. And I'll be, I'll be focusing uh, on, on, on the legal uh, reform initiatives the new administration is uh, uh, is undertaking. It's, it's an ongoing process, uh, uh, so it's within that uh, uh, framework that we need to see it. Because uh, when we talk of uh, uh, legal reform, uh, we're obviously talking about uh, uh, big, big ideas of, uh, of, of justice, uh, uh, leveling the playing field for different actors, uh, about transparency, accountability, and, and, and ensuring uh, participation uh, uh, of citizens, and, and to that effect, democratizing uh, uh, institutions and, and the state apparatus, uh, all in all. So, uh, I mean, uh, I don't want to be too uh, uh, skeptical about this, uh, this initiative. Uh, I acknowledge that this is a very important step towards uh, uh, the right direction. But uh, the legal reform initiative uh, that has been taking place in Ethiopia uh, could be categorized as, as, a, as its uh, very early, early stage, uh, uh, so to say. But I'm going to elaborate uh, further on that. But uh, I mean, to, to give credit to the new administration and the newly appointed prime minister, uh, he, took, he took a, a, remarkable, a remarkable measure uh, in terms of uh, taking some, some concrete uh, legislative measures, uh, especially, uh, you know, he, he, he set up an advisory council at the Attorney General's office, uh, uh, advisory council on legal and justice uh, matters to actually oversee and give uh, uh, advisory uh, opinion and uh, draft legislations uh, on, on, on different levels, which is uh, pretty much concentrated at the federal level. So, I mean, uh, this advisory council uh, uh, has recently uh, proposed a draft legislation to uh, legislations, actually, a uh, set of legislations uh, to, to repeal the draconian laws, such as the Child and Societies Proclamation. Uh, and, and the law has been recently enacted by the parliament and I mean, this new law uh, has, has actually repealed the foreign funding restriction, the restriction on, uh, on networking, the restriction on uh, uh, different categorizations based on the area of work. So uh, this new law has been, uh, I mean, can be considered as the most uh, permissive uh, uh, by, by, by any standard. So uh, they, they are successful in, in, in actually repealing the Charity and Society's proclamation. There is an ongoing uh, media law uh, legislation. They have recently tabled uh, hate speech uh, uh, legislation to mitigate the problem of uh, hate speech and, and uh, uh, misinformation. So uh, I mean, except the Charity and Society's proclamation, almost uh, 
the media law, the anti-terrorism proclamation, the electoral law, uh, all of them are uh, ongoing process. Uh, it's still uh, tabled for discussion and it's at, at, a, at a draft stage. But I mean, uh, but all this signifies that the new administration uh, uh, has a serious political commitment to actually initiate this kind of legislative measures uh, uh, to repeal draconian laws. Uh, but however, I mean, uh, this is only, uh, uh, I mean, one of my, uh, uh, my critic about this legal initiative is it seems like the, the whole uh, uh, legal reform uh, initiative is being confined to uh, repealing laws, right? So I mean, uh, uh, repealing laws is, is of course important, but it's only one uh, uh, small subset of uh, a bigger institutional reform that should happen, right? And of course, I mean, for that, we need time. And, and uh, Abiy Ahmed has only been in power for one year, and this advisory council has only been eight months. And it's only understandable, you know, uh, it's only understandable to, uh, for this challenge to come now. But uh, uh, I mean, my, 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 my concern about this legal initiative is we don't have to be uh, single-mindedly focused on repealing laws but there needs to be a, a bigger strategic and comprehensive uh, 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 government initiative to actually overhaul the criminal justice system, to overhaul the security uh, apparatus, uh, and to restructure uh, uh, the judiciary and all democratic institutions uh, for that matter. So uh, as much as it's important to focus on repealing all the draconian laws, uh, it's also important to give due emphasis for this kind of uh, big strategic level, uh, comprehensive uh, 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 legal reform initiatives. So, uh, and obviously, I mean, uh, so some of the uh, the persistent uh, critics uh, uh, about this advisory council and the role of the uh, the advisory council in initiating reforms was. I mean, there were questions of uh, credibility uh, about uh, uh, about this entity because uh, the uh, the vetting process was not uh, public and transparent. But as you can, I mean, understandably, the new administration is under a lot of political pressure from inside and outside to reform. So, I mean, uh, there was a, a, a need to uh, to move quickly in terms of uh, bringing people on board, and of course. Admittedly, I mean, the way the advisory council uh, to, to do this legal reform has been composed of is, and it's brought in one of the best and brightest uh, legal minds in Ethiopia. So uh, f uh, I think they need to get uh, credit for that, but uh, there has been uh, uh, critics by some people that the process of vetting these people, because it's an important uh, public office, uh, so uh, the process of vetting these people was not transparent enough. A and the other uh, major concern uh, that has been raised was uh, poor consultation, uh, which of course might lead to a problem of credibility and, and, and legitimacy of the whole process. Because uh, in all these draft legislations and the, uh, uh, the level of public consultation uh, can be considered uh, as very weak given, again, the limited time. So uh, people were, uh, I mean, were very uh, concerned about, uh, you know, uh, the level of consultation that were happening. Uh, and I mean, the other uh, uh, big challenge for this new administration is uh, including the, uh, the Advisory Council for Legal and Justice uh, Affairs at the Attorney General. And multiple other committees and advisory councils uh, have been mushrooming in different institutions. If you go to the judiciary, there's a committee doing a reform at the Attorney General's office, the advisory council, at the primary, uh, at the prime minister's office, many other uh, committees and advisory councils are mushrooming to actually uh, deal with, uh, uh, I mean, uh, to initiate different uh, reform measures. But the problem is, uh, I mean, one of my great concerns is if you're doing a lot of 
these kinds of initiatives through ad hoc mechanisms, like committees and advisory councils, it has the potential of undermining already existing institutions, which needs to be democratized, which needs to be engaged. I don't think these ideal committees are totally outside of these already existing institutions. They are within these already existing institutions, but due care should be taken that these kinds of ad hoc parallel initiatives should not undermine already existing institutions. So uh, uh, these and other kinds of uh, uh, structural challenges uh, uh, can be considered. I mean, the, the other uh, important thing is, uh, one of the most important uh, challenge for the whole legal reform is uh, the lack of consensus and, and, and shared responsibility uh, among the political elites uh, in Ethiopia. That is posing uh, a great challenge to uh, to the ongoing legal reform in terms of its effectiveness. Because there's, a, as Obang and all the other uh, panelists mentioning, the, the widespread uh, ethnic violence and, and the enormous challenge it's putting through on the security and law enforcement apparatus is actually undermining the credibility and legitimacy of the administration to effectively implement uh, the, uh, the legal initiatives uh, uh, that are taking place. So uh, I think uh, we should be, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to finalize my comment uh, highlighting that legal reform is a very gradual process and it will continue to be a very gradual and complex process uh, and, and, and the, the success uh, uh, and effectiveness of the legal reform depends on the Abiy Ahmed administration to secure peace and stability of the country and uh, to build its internal capacity to implement uh, the legislative initiatives uh, uh, that they put forward. Thank you. Thank you all very much for your comments. Um, we have a lot of time for a bus Q&A session. I'd just like to note that I think there are a couple common threads throughout all the presentations. The first is the importance of institutions, um, and for to think more broadly, largely a more comprehensive reform process in Ethiopia going forward. And the second is the importance of dialogue and engagement and consultations, uh, broadening that out, not just geog geographically, but also thinking in terms of other people that should be brought into these uh, reform initiatives. Um, so we can open up for q and it will take a couple at a time. If you could uh, keep it to a question and identify yourself. We have somebody coming around. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Yosef Berhe. I'm from Eritrean Press Group. My question is for Casa Home Follow. I'm really surprised you don't mention the new organization called Horn of Africa Trade Unions. Does anything happen? And uh, as far as I know, this organization is headquartered in Addis and led by the Eritrean representative and you are the secretary of the new organization. Uh, it's very quite surprising. I don't know, I think you know better because you were in Masawa in September and you spent a week. Uh, in Eritrea, 95%, without knowing maybe more, 95% of the workforce is slave. They don't get paid and it takes a day to explain about what's in Eritrea, but you know better about that. So there is no trade union, and I don't know with what you want to do, and can you explain to me the so-called Horn African Trade Union, the purpose and the method, and also what's the agreement you guys made in Masawa? Uh, so the, the, my question, there are two questions first. Please explain the Horn of Africa Trade Union and the purpose, and the second one is was the agreement made on Masawa? And the general question maybe for all of you guys, uh, everybody's complaining about Haile Mariam and TPLF, and you guys were willing to work with PFDJ and Isaias. Uh, I don't know, maybe this one is like, you're working for peace and stability in Ethiopia, but the price of Eritrean people, everything you mentioned here is maybe worse in Eritrea, so, the last one is the new things, even Yosef and uh, Kassam mentioned, region, regional, regional agreement, but 
the real thing is that new thing is happening with Eritrea. So when we're talking about Eritrea, what about the Eritrean people? You guys make a peace with the president, the worst of worst, maybe next North Korea. So what are you guys expecting to get, to get a peace? Talking about press law. Ethiopia is heaven for press law compared to Eritrea. Human rights, that's the worst one. So the problem happened in Ethiopia, I believe, is regional. What happened in Ethiopia is regional. Everything you see in Ethiopia, the OLF, whatever, the, whatever military group, come from Eritrea. Everything in Ethiopia right now deployed from Eritrea, all the political groups. And you enjoy what happened right now. So uh, this is an opinion, but my question is for Mr. Kazan. Please explain for the new, about the new organization. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, thank you for these wonderful presentations on this extremely vital. My, uh, Michael Lund, uh, Institute of World Affairs. Um, none of you exactly focused uh, on the economy, and so my question has to do with what do you know about changes that are being contemplated in the developmental state model for economic growth? I think this affects a whole bunch of things, uh, uh, among which you've touched. Um, the youth unemployment uh, problem, uh, the ability of political parties to uh, have resources to organize and to function, uh, not to mention the whole range of civil society groups uh, needing money, um, the possible uh, obstacle of the security forces being involved in the economy. So uh, I think underlying all of these ideals is a somewhat more uh, nitty-gritty uh, materialist sort of conception that focuses on where are the, where's the money going to come from to support youth employment programs, investment, that kind of thing. Thank you. Good morning, uh, JT, Center for Armed Relations Committee. Just wanted to ask a question from your perspective, how you uh, felt or thought about U.S. assistance. Um, having just come myself from an implementer side, uh, I've witnessed it move very slow, especially on the democracy and governance front, um, but there have been efforts to coordinate. Just want to get your perspective. Do you feel that the U.S. is being helpful in its assistance strategy? And uh, what, what can be done to make it better? We'll take those three questions right now. Um, first on Eritrea and Confederations. Um, the economy, challenges to the economy, and U.S. assistance. Do you want to take the first one? Okay. <coughs> Thank you very much for, for your mentioning about uh, HACTU. HACTU is the Horn of African Confederation of Trade Unions. Because of time limits, uh, I didn't mention about HACTU. Uh, act to is, uh, purpose of ACTU is um, to strengthen people-to-people uh, relation. Uh, let me show you, I think, uh, since you are from Horn of Africa, you know the situation of uh, Horn Africa. That is a uh, <coughs> boundary conflict in uh, East Africa, here in the Zaire, not only Eritrea and Ethiopia, that is official. There is a conflict between Djibouti and Eritrea. There is a conflict between Eritrea and the Sudan, the Sol. There is a boundary conflict and uh, internal conflict in uh, Ethiopia, in Somalia, and everywhere in Horn of Africa. This is the situation. Uh, so the poverty is deep rooted in uh, uh, Horn of Africa. Uh, migration issue is uh, very high in uh, uh, Horn of Africa. Some of them, they are, uh, no, not some, most of them migrate to uh, Middle East, some of them to South Africa and everywhere. Um, even uh, there's a, a problem of this uh, 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 good governance, lack of good governance in Ethiopia, in Eritrea, in Djibouti, in Somalia, in Sudan, uh, in South Sudan. Look at South Sudan today, they are in conflict. 
also there is uh, uh, some conflict in uh, North Sudan. So uh, there is a corruption. So to change the Horn of Africa situation uh, as a trade union, we have to work together. This is the purpose. Uh, to strengthen the people-to-people -people, uh, relation, to work on uh, poverty, on migration, on uh, good governance issues uh, <coughs> with uh, uh, other trade unions together. So uh, regarding the Eritrean Confederation, uh, our agreement is not in uh, Mesua, not about uh, Masawa. It's agreement between uh, trade union uh, and uh, the Confederation of Eritrean uh, no, uh, Eritrean Federation and the uh, Confederation of Ethiopian Trade Union, not about Masawa, not in Masawa, is in Asmara. Just to strengthen the people uh, people relation, we are visiting Eritrea and the Masawa. So at that time, we have discussed with the uh, uh, Eritrean Federation to work together to harmonize or uh, to work together for peace building. That's only not. Uh, we are not mentioned about the internal issue of the federation or the confederation. So <coughs> we, we want to create independent trade union uh, in Horn of African member countries. Uh, look at Confederation of Ethiopian Trade Union is a member of ITC, ITUC, International Trade Union Confederation, the member of ITUC Africa. <coughs> so. We went uh, to create a more independent uh, union in the region. But union only, they cannot make a change. Just to collaborate with other uh, civil society. That is our initiative. So this is the purpose of this uh, uh, hack to. Um, question on the economy. I can say a few words on, on that. I, I think uh, the, the question about the uh, visible policy measures regarding the economy is I think it, it, this is better be seen as, as part of, I think, uh, the ongoing challenge uh, the new administration is having uh, in terms of uh, crafting a compelling message uh, regarding the, the entire uh, reform process, I think. Uh, by default, a lot of uh, the, 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 the news, a lot of the, the, de the debate seems to be overly focused on uh, the political aspect of it, I think, uh, to, to the extent that it may uh, even harm uh, the vibrancy of the, the debates, the discourse that needed to be had uh, on, on topics like the economy and uh, the even social issues. So uh, I think other than uh, the, the initial remarks by the, the new prime minister about uh, liberalizing uh, this, the economy in general, uh, specifically by giving away a part of the, the, the shares within the monopoly, uh, uh, the government monopolies such as the telecom, air transport, and uh, power generation uh, uh, sectors, uh, you wouldn't see a lot of uh, other deputies, economic advisors, coming out and articulating how that works uh, uh, and why uh, that liberalization is being uh, an imperative. I think uh, that that uh, can be seen in the broader uh, challenge that, that the government is facing in terms of crafting that message. Uh, and also, I think that the, the, the focus on uh, the, the stagnating economy and the focus on uh, managing the, the debt stress uh, uh, seems to be uh, taking away again uh, the, the, the most of uh, the conversations that needed to be had. Uh, I, I also, I think, related to this transparency and openness uh, in terms of running the government, I think the Eritrean uh, 
uh, topic, I think, that the, the question uh, is, I think, shared by a lot of Ethiopians in terms of having transparency as to how uh, this peace uh, normalization of relations with Eritrea is going to work. Uh, there has not been a lot of details about uh, how economic relationships are being restored, how they are going to be managed, and uh, whenever these are raised, uh, I think in including the prime minister, there seem to be a very defensive stance in terms of uh, trying to uh, uh, m maybe push people to be uh, grateful for, for, for the peace that, that is brought by the new administration versus explaining the details of how these relationships were because of, I think, dubious relationships that the, pr the previous government and the, the elites had uh, a, a bloody war uh, uh, occurred uh, in 1991. So I think the question of having clear, uh, transparent communication regarding uh, not just normalizing relationships in Ethiopia uh, with Eritrea, but also uh, the, the integration efforts that the, the prime minister seems to be uh, advancing across the Horn of Africa region uh, needs to be laid out. The details need to be communicated to, to people, I think. Uh, in, in terms of, I think, uh, U.S. assistance, I think uh, the, 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 the public relations aspect of it, I think, uh, is improved yeah, in terms of showing uh, support to the ongoing reforms, which is, I, I believe, positive. But, but I think uh, not just for the U.S., but for the entire uh, uh, donor community, th there needs to be some prudence uh, in terms of uh, identifying exact needs, uh, proper uh, uh, priorities, uh, rather than, I think, uh, instinctively rushing to, uh, I, I think, be a part of uh, something great, frankly. But, but, but I think uh, uh, a careful uh, uh, examination of where uh, the support need to be uh, extended. And uh, I, I think, uh, ag again, uh, transparency in that regard is also uh, uh, required because I think past experience shows that uh, uh, there is a lot of skepticism, a growing skepticism over, over the past 10 years because of uh, the West's, uh, I think, very loyal support, apparent support to uh, the Ethiopian government prioritizing security relations uh, without uh, or with very little emphasis uh, on uh, democratization and human rights protection. So I think uh, uh, trying to win back that uh, skepticism and uh, trying to build uh, trust among citizens uh, is, is key, I think. Uh, one last point, I think, in, in terms of, again, going back to the messaging uh, aspect of it, I think, uh, from the very beginning, uh, a lot of people have uh, emphasized the need to uh, detach uh, political reforms in Ethiopia from the person of the prime minister. I think uh, uh, that, that cannot be overemphasized uh, uh, again. I think the, what affects the messaging, what, uh, what affects, I think, the speed and efficiency of responsiveness to people's demands seems to be uh, too much reliance on uh, the Prime Minister's personal uh, intervention on a lot of issues uh, rather than uh, other deputies stepping up and explaining and uh, uh, addressing uh, growing uh, demands from, from people. So I think uh, there, there, needs con there, there continues to be a need to uh, depersonalize this uh, reforms from the person of the Prime Minister. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, thing on, on terms of economy, I think that you mentioned on traveling throughout the countries, we've seen a lot of young people. Ethiopia, as they say, that, you know, a young population, almost 70% of the population are under the age of 30. Uh, and most of these are young people who are looking for a job. One thing we've seen that seems to be there is no roadmap for economy. And because that go back to what I say earlier, that, you know, the direction, there's no roadmap, a clear roadmap to where the country is going. Uh, second, too, there's so many instability going on in the places. Uh, you know, in every other part of the regions, you see this violence going on, and some of these violence are ethnic-based issues where, you know, it's a paradox. On the top, you see uh, you have a prime minister speaking about uh, we are one Ethiopian. The Ethiopian patriotism is really it's amazing and great, but at the bottom, there are some people who say this is the time now that uh, we advance our ethnicity. So the two doesn't connect. And also one thing we found that some of the young people, you will not get a job in certain states unless, you know, because the regions are named after the ethnic group, most of them. And so unless you are from that region, you cannot get a job in other places. So I find that that was one of the things that we found difficult talking to the young people. But the biggest thing is lack of job to many kids. This prime minister gave so much hope to the countries. Uh, and now the hope people were looking for something to come through is not going to. Now the hope has turned to anxieties. A gentle farmer told me that, you know, well, you can give someone a hope, but when that hope, right now we are living on hope, but when the hope go, we don't know where we're going to go. So the same thing that in terms of the economy that he's talking about. So the economy of the country is really, there's a problem. I know that the prime minister went to come to Europe and there's some donor wanting to give the money, this is good. But again, unless you deal, give the people hope and take away that anxiety from people and feeling that things are stable. Even the capital city now, there's a debate who the Saba should belong to. So that's what I mean, the issues that, you know, from the outside we don't know, but what's going on inside is much more grim than what we are seeing. So the issues of economy, the reason why we didn't touch it, it's not like it's important. It's not like it's not, it's not important. It's very important. But there are other things that you are dealing with. You know, people buying guns. You seeing, you know, uh, because the whole country is that we don't have an ideological political party. We have a political party based on ethnicities. And people feel that it is my turn to eat. Some of the people are now claiming, even with the prime minister coming, there are some group who say it's our turn, not the turn of the countries. So in that case, our turn also that, you know, so you want to have the money, you have the, the whatever source for yourself. For the last 27 years, people live into that kind of thing. And so where the country is going, in terms of if you deal with the economy, you have to deal with this big elephant in the room, which is eating the societies alive. That is causing almost 3 million people from you know, being displaced from their place. We don't even know when they will be going back home. Recently, you know, it came out to ours and where the Ethiopian diaspora raised, you know, uh, money. Money is just a bandage solution. But would these people go back home? We are talking about election, you know, exactly a year ago from, a year from now. Would that time, would the election go? And if election go, election is not just going to go and vote. You have to really make, prepare the people mentally to go and vote and see who they will vote to. Would that be something? Especially having a country where someone cannot go and have a campaign in a different region because their ethnic group doesn't belong into that. Because we become a whole bunch of uh, tens of tribals rather than a nation. It's very difficult for a nation building. It's very difficult to build, to bring the economy. So that brings back to you what the U.S. could do. I think the U.S. has to definite speak out about this, you know, the critic. We should not be quiet. Yes, the change is good. But again, the change of the country cannot be wrong around only a prime minister and individuals. And this is the thing that Ethiopia has so many missed opportunities. When Ayala Selassie government collapsed, we did not have a transitional where the people-driven movement came in. The Derge came in, carry on, Red Terror, so many people were killed. When the Derge collapsed, the TPLF, the group that the separates who went to the roof, to the camp, to the bush, not to liberate Ethiopia, to liberate their ethnicity, came in and they took over. In terms of the international community kind of rally on them by having a conference in London. We don't want a second conference, second tribal conference in this time. 
So the U.S. also has to be. I know that Armin Cohen and other group play before, but now what the Ethiopian want is a democratic government of the people by the people, and that's why they support Abi, even though Abi belonged to the party that terrorized them for the last 27 years. So the U.S. can play a role, and the role is to empower the people. Right now, we become that the prime minister becomes the opposition is the government. The opposition who went back from here to the countries, they are in Addis, they don't have the money, they don't have the resources, they cannot organize. Most of them, 107 organizations, out of that, all of them is by tribal, because by organizing a political party by ethnicity in Ethiopia, become a passion. So U.S. can, and donor country, can empower those people to let them have a dialogue among themselves, to let them even talk and say that, you know what, we deserve, in 21st century, no one should be able to run the country based on a tribal of ancient time. So in that case, the donor like NDA and, NDA and other group are doing a good job. Right now it seems to be that, yes, the prime minister is keeping the country together in a way it's, it's one guy that attached the people, but the rest of the people don't get, they're really disconnected. So the U.S. can play a bigger role. Number one, to, you know, to support you know, the civic organization. Number two, to really talk about it. And if something is wrong, let's say it. Because the great thing that the Prime Minister has done, it is commendable, we should not forget about that. But that alone is not enough. We have to cross to the other side of the rivers until we get there. What kind of boat are we using to cross on so most of the Ethiopians don't drown or being taken by whatever that would be? So the U.S. can play a role. But I always say that it is not the West that who will free us, Ethiopian. We can free ourselves. But before I used to say that, don't let the U.S. and West become a roadblock to us. We can free ourselves, but what we need is a support. So lack of roadmap is a problem. I remember South Sudan was in this kind of positions where there was no lack of roadmap. And no, now we know where it is. Lack of roadmap, a critical roadmap to where we're going could be a problem. And we don't want Ethiopia to miss this opportunity. Ayla's last opportunity, Mingista's opportunity, now another opportunity should not be missed. But again, the Ethiopian need a dialogue to sit down, talk to each other, not about each other to deal with these issues that are affecting them. It is not only about their tribe, but about the future of Ethiopia, about the future of Africa, about the future of the U.S., and about the future of the humanity as a well. whole. So the U.S. can play a role. In other words, not only the U.S., even the EU and other groups. Abi is a one guy, but we should not put every boat, everything in him, just like every other country. Imagine where we are. If we give everything for the president of this country to elect all the judge to do this, if it is not right in Washington, shouldn't it be right in Ethiopia? Thank you. Yeah, uh, I mean to to add one one more point on what Obang said. I mean to basically complement it uh, to an extent, but I think uh, it's important that we need to have uh, a, a dialogue, a national dialogue, to talk about these things because it's a very important uh, constitutional moment in Ethiopia, where people are uh, questioning the very essence of the constitution, which is uh, ethnic-based federalism. But I think we should be also very careful that uh, uh, ethnic politics uh, is, is well entrenched in Ethiopia. And this is a reality that we should face. So when we talk of uh, a dialogue, we don't have to uh, uh, categorize them in a simplistic term of tribalism or something. It has got a very bad connotation in a way. It's, it's an ethnic question. It's, it's a... Uh, it's no cultural justice question, it's a historical question. So uh, we need to, uh, uh, to recognize uh, what uh, uh, other people uh, are demanding because ethnic question is something uh, that's real in Ethiopia. And this, the, ethnic, the ethno-cultural justice question is not something that has been created by EPRDF 27 years ago. It's a historical question. So we need to be able to address that historical question by recognizing people and by recognizing them as, as who they are, right? So it's important uh, to, uh, to have that uh, dialogue and conversation and uh, to think of uh, the legal reform in its uh, bigger, bigger spectrum uh, as, in, uh, as in it's a very important constitutional moment. We should also think of, you know, uh, is, is ethnic federalism working? Uh, well, why is, why is uh, uh, ethnic federalism not working? What are the structural flaws within the design? 
uh, and the ideology behind it, and what are the ways of actually bringing this uh, ultra-Ethiopian nationalists and ultra-ethno-nationalists uh, to bring them into the center. So uh, this requires, you know, uh, both, we need to be, uh, it requires mutual recognition that uh, both the ethnic nationalists and the uh, ultra-Ethiopian nationalists, uh, or whatever you call them, uh, it's important to recognize each other. That's where we can find uh, a common ground and a sensible solution uh, to the problem. Uh, to just add uh, one more point, uh, whether the, there is a change in the developmental state model uh, is, I mean, as far as my, my, my reading is concerned, I think even recently the, uh, the, uh, the EPRDF uh, uh, Congress, during the Congress, I mean, after they have just completed the Congress, uh, the press release and, and the party manifesto and everything you see is uh, they are claiming that the developmental, the developmental state policy is still in place, but uh, we don't have to this, we don't have, we do, uh, I think the way we should think about the developmental state is obviously uh, there could be multiple uh, chains within the plan, but I think uh, EPRDF as a party uh, uh, seems to be still uh, committed to this idea of uh, developmental state, but uh, is it being democratized or is it being uh, liberalized to an extent? There could be that, uh, that element of it. But at, at least official, by their official declaration, they claim that they st uh, still stick to the, uh, the uh, developmental state plan. Okay. We'll take three more questions. Hi, uh, my name is Penelope Kiritsis. I'm here with the Worker Rights Consortium. And I just had a question about the, it's mostly for Kasahun, uh, about the labor strikes that took place in March in Hawassa Industrial Park and just generally C2 and other civil societies, organiza civil society organizations role in um, moving towards a minimum wage in Ethiopia. Uh, a few years ago, I was in Nairobi, Kenya, for three months and a half. Can you explain to me who, uh, what the relation Ethiopia has with Kenya? And also, in the Library Congress here, there is a small co coffee shop operated by Eritorean people. I wonder what the uh, relation Ethiopia has with the editorial, thank you. My name is Carrie Grunlow from USAID, and my question is about um, dialogue. Most of you have mentioned the, the really um, urgent need for dialogue within Ethiopia, and I'm just wondering if you have any advice for us on who has the moral authority or the legitimacy to be able to bring people together in a neutral space to have that kind of dialogue that all of you have highlighted is necessary. Thank you. All right. Um, so we'll take those three questions. <coughs> um, questions on dialogue, uh, costume for the, the strikes and the pay questions and um, regional relationships. I can take the question on dialogue. Okay. Well, why don't we start with Kasun on the, the first question? Uh -huh. Yeah, on the minimum wage, and then we can open it up. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, uh, there is no minimum wage in Ethiopia. Regarding the Awasa Industry Park, we are trying to unionize them, but because of the employers' the resistance, we didn't unionize them. One of the challenges of the Confederation of Ethiopian Trade Union, freedom of association is not respected in, uh, in uh, foreign direct investors. That's a uh, great problem. Look at in Awasa Industry Park. They are not unionized. In Bolilem, in Kumbulcha, in uh, Bahardar, in Mekale, in Deredoa, they are not unionized. Not only in industry park. Most of the investors, foreign uh, investors, they don't want to see the labor union 
and their uh, companies. This is a challenge. Uh, regarding the strike in Awasa, uh, they are strike by themselves, no, not uh, by trade union. So uh, there is no minimum wage. They earn it. They earn 750 Ethiopian bir in industrial park and other industrial zones. That means less than $30 per month. So how can they survive by 750 Ethiopian bir or $25 per month? That's the question. So <coughs> now I, uh, regarding the minimum wage, now we are on liberal reform. Already we are finalized at the tripartite level. Tripartite forum means from employers, from worker side, from government, five five representative. So we are finalized the uh, liberal reform and we submit it to the uh, cabinet. Still we are waiting for the approval of the cabinet regarding the minimum wage. It is included in the, in the new level uh, law reform. Um, regarding the strike, if, even if they are unionized, they have right to strike if they are not agree uh, on their rights. <coughs> also, we are, wo we are working on uh, organizing uh, issues. That is, uh, before the resistance is not from only the employers, also from some government officials, particularly the investment commission. Now, after they change the uh, commissioner, now uh, it is better than before. Now, at the national level, we established a committee who can um, plan for the uh, unionization of the workers to aware the employers, also to aware the workers from uh, Ministry of Labor, from uh, Investment Commission, Commissioner and the Deputy Commissioner, uh, from C2, myself, and uh, from ILO. So there are committees who are working on these uh, unionization issues. So uh, this is uh, uh, development about organizing the workers. Thank you. All right. um, and then questions of dialogue. Did you want to say something yes, about uh, at, the, at the national level, as the workers, uh, we have dialogue. That means from uh, employers, from uh, workers, from uh, government representative. But uh, the problem is all the uh, foreign uh, investors, they are not member of the employers' federation. That's the question. And each industry park, they have their own association, but they are not member of the uh, employers' uh, federation. So when we have uh, dialogue together uh, for the employers' uh, sides, it is difficult to implement to the grassroots level. That is our gap. Uh, but we have a national uh, advisory board uh, that is uh, uh, discussing on uh, issue of uh, legal uh, reform, on uh, issue of uh, organizing uh, freedom of association, and different things. So we have dialogue uh, every two months. Yes. yes yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I think on 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 getting <coughs> a, a, a neutral a neutral convener for. Uh, this uh, much talk about dialogue. I, I think I, I, I continue to believe that, that your best bet uh, remains to be the, the civil society sector, but, but there is a massive uh, structural capacity and legitimacy related challenges about that. Uh, uh, I think years of repression, both in institutionalized uh, and uh, arbitrary uh, measures by by the EPRDF government resulted in in a serious in a serious diminishing of the capacity of civil society organizations, uh, professional associations, 
and uh, the, the entire uh, non-state actor uh, community. Uh, this was not done only through uh, enacting uh, draconian legislation, that is a big part of it, but, but also that there is massive uh, co-optation strategy uh, by the party to really uh, undermine uh, organizations, non-state uh, organizations, non-governmental organizations, including uh, uh, in some cases trade unions, in some cases uh, teachers' association with previously with big uh, representation and a degree of legitimacy by infiltrating them and co-opting them and making them uh, mouthpieces of the ruling party. I think that uh, deficit uh, in legitimacy uh, continues to be uh, a big challenge moving forward. But, but also there is opportunity. There is a new uh, normative framework uh, uh, by way of uh, the charities, uh, the, the new civil society organizations uh, proclamations. I think uh, this law not only removed the, the, the structural obstacles to uh, freedom of association uh, and the resources necessary uh, to exercise those, but also I think emancipated a, a, a sector of the society that were uh, urging for uh, organizing and being able to exercise what is provided under uh, uh, the Constitution and what has been seen in neighboring countries like Kenya, at least uh, on the face of it. So I, I think with uh, investment on rebuilding uh, the capacity of civil society organizations, uh, investment on uh, rebuilding the trust and efficiency of uh, the independent media, uh, and I think again uh, investing on youth, new generation, uh, cause-minded uh, activists, uh, th there is I think a good chance of uh, trying to convene multiple uh, 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 sessions of dialogue in, in a number of issues, both uh, in the capital, but I think most uh, importantly uh, outside uh, of the capital, because uh, going around and talking to people as recently as January in Ethiopia, it, it, there seems to be a sense that the, the average citizen outside of the country 20, 200 kilometers outside of the capital, it, it's th their understanding, their uh, uh, feeling about the, the changes, the massive changes that are taking place in the country seems to be only uh, a hearsay. It's not a first-hand exp experience for many people, so I think uh, there is uh, uh, and, and a critical need to, to spread that dialogue, that conversation to the local level, not just being uh, televised as many uh, said uh, in conversations about uh, what is going on in Ethiopia. So I, I, I think uh, reinvesting uh, investing in rebuilding civil society and independent media for me is very critical. Uh, yes, uh, for sure dialogue is very, very important. It also is urgent. Uh, we're dealing with, the, we don't know what will happen, you know, two months from now, three months from now. So the sooner for sure you do it, the better. Uh, so what could we do, you know, uh, if say that uh, charity proclamation that we had before, it almost disseminated uh, all any kind of activity in Ethiopia. It was again this law for women empowerment, child rights, reconciliation, even it was anti people getting together. So with that being real I feel now this opening. When I was in Ethiopia, one of the things I was really amazed about as it was uh, freedom of expression, you know, there was media was, you know, opened. I, you know, and I was you know interview and I was speaking like the way I'm speaking here, most of the media you know, maybe except those people who really Fear of the inclusive thinking, those are the group who they were not interested with it in idea, but the most of them they did cover. But who could we do, who could you work with? I think that youth is one of the groups that, and elders, and then women. 
and the religious leaders. So some of those groups actually are they're the ones that are keeping the peace. As I was saying, in some regions, the change did not trickle down. They changed the top. But the same people who are you know, running the Warada or Kabele are the same cadre that used to be there before. So it's very difficult to clean those people. Amazingly that, you know, traveling in the country, one of the places that I feel the most safe, even then others, people told me, it's in Jigjiga, in Somalia regions. And because of Mustafa, the new leader who went there, he pretty much, what he did was amazing that most of the cadre from before, he kind of cleaned it up and put the new people in there. And most of the people who are not Somalian, and Amara, Tigray, from other ethnic groups, they say that we feel this is our home, this is our regions. There are other regions where people don't feel safe because they don't belong to that area. But people don't talk to each other. They talk about each other. And that's this what we're trying to do is now to engage the young people when we went and talked to them at the university. A kid from Gambela doesn't know what's going on in Afar. A kid in Afar doesn't know what's going on in the South. And with this idea now, lack of you know, someone taking initiative and bring them in the same room. When I go and talk to them, I told them that you may be a son of somebody, you are a son of somebody else. You come from a different ethnic group. You come from different religion. What makes us an Ethiopian is not our language, because we don't have the same language, not our skin color. We don't have the same skin colors. It is, you know, the land that we call Ethiopia as all. So, but the process Need to, they need to be brought together and let them talk to each other. So let them define the humanity of one another. And the time is now before it's too late because we don't know what could happen unless we deal with this. As I was saying, this, people are living with anxiety. There's fear of what will happen tomorrow. Even I talked to some Ethiopian at home, even in here, who were thinking of moving to Ethiopia. Now they're saying, oh, maybe I should not be. So lack of dialogue, discourse, civil discourse is a big problem. So I think that there are capable Ethiopian, brilliant young men and women and elders who can really play a bigger role and bring and engage the people. Empowering those people financially would be a crucial thing. Giving them the knowledge, the skills, teaching them what it means to be a human, not ethnicity. You, I can be proud of who I am as ethnic group, but what makes me to be more than my ethnicity? My identity is not only my ethnicity. I'm a black man, I'm a bald man, I'm bald head, and all of these things. You put all those together. But in Ethiopia, we've been told, I am only what my ethnicity is. So this can only be solved by civil discourse, discussion in a way. So empowering those people like our group, we are planning of going to go to Ethiopia and have this kind of thing, bring some young people, training the trainer, let them go back to the community. But I think that empowering those people to those who are willing to do something would be a very effective because teaching them, you know, someone say that, you know, uh, you teach this kid, now about respecting one another, they could be the one that who can build a country together tomorrow. So I think that that's a very crucial thing to do, and there's urgency of doing it now. <clears throat> Just to add uh, one more point, I mean, uh, when, we, when we think about uh, uh, initiating dialogues in a very uh, protracted uh, ethnic conflict setting, I mean, uh, we have to recognize that uh, there is no as such a neutral space. It's, I mean, everything is politically charged. We have to start from admitting that everything is politically charged. By recognizing that, we, we, we actually built an internal mechanism to mitigate the, the political biases of those spaces. So it shouldn't necessarily be, uh, I mean, I, I believe civil society is one important sector. Media is, is an, another important space to facilitate such kind of dialogue but also political parties for it, but also universities, but also religious institutions. So these kinds of dialogues can happen in, in multiple spaces, in multiple times, in, at, 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 in, in different modalities. So uh, the important thing is uh, setting the agenda for dialogue. Setting the agenda for dialogue means uh, how do we recognize difference? How do we understand difference? I mean, especially in a, a multi-ethnic uh, country like ours, uh, we need to be able uh, to, to carefully craft the agenda for, for, for dialogue. I think that's the most important space. But, uh, and how to do the dialogue and who are the responsible actors, it can happen in multiple forms, I think. Right. So I'm gonna take two very targeted questions um, and then targeted responses. 
over right here. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Gutu Wayesa. I'm from the University of Helsinki, postdoctoral researcher there in Finland. But currently, I'm based at American University as visiting research scholar. Um, let me start by pointing that. Uh, do you this do a quick question, please? My question, actually, I, I wanted to comment on the whole setting, uh, but some of my comments were already addressed by Seifu. But as a way of uh, recommend acknowledging the importance of such events, I recently saw a strategy called the Sandwich Strategy, where openings from top are mashed or met with uh, advocacy and, and policy reforms, uh, collective actions from below. That is an, uh, that that quite quite well fits with the title of the uh, seminar itself. My question is now: if we try to start dialogue, genuine dialogue, engagement with the public, um, is it not because I'm referring to Obang's call for critical thinking? As we engage in critical thinking, we need to also think about the the concepts that we use in framing the problems as we try to come up with, with certain solutions. Uh, this tribalism, in, in fact, is very, very dangerous concept to begin with as an issue uh, to, to, to think about. If we frame of the current problems within the last 27 years, that is also prob problematic as we try to uh, chart uh, a, road, uh, a roadmap for the future. So is the current problems of ethnic conflict, the problems that we see, is it really because the constitution was or is implemented? Or is it because it has been denied actually until last year from implementation? Do we, do we have self-rule and shared rule in, in real sense of the term in the federation that is operational in the, in the country? And without seeing it implemented in the first place, how do we evaluate it and try to frame it as a problem to begin the reform with a constitutional reform, with, with of course, majority of people opposing this initiative to begin with issues of institu constitutional reform before other potential ground clearing has been made. I have a lot of points to, to, to make, but let me stop here. Thank you. Um, well, I, I couldn't put it more eloquently about the, you know, the perfect storm that's gathering in Ethiopia than what Obang Meto and uh, and uh, Yosef and all of, all the rest of you say. It's really a dangerous situation, uh, and ethnicity is really becoming a serious problem. So my specific question is to Mr. Kasa on follow. I mean, unions are so important in any country, you know, to bring people together because they always work across, you know, the you know the the whole, uh, you know, state, nation. So, and the first, you know, thing that the previous re regime did is assassinate, you know, Kasa uh, Maru, uh, who was the first uh, union leader of Ethiopia. Asafa Maru, you know, that's, that's how it started. Asafa Maru was assassinated by the previous regime. You guys, the country is being organized along ethnic lines. What are you doing? Are you also organized along ethnic lines? Is that how you operate within Ethiopia, organizing unions? What are you doing to combat this imminent problem that's coming up to the country? Okay, because I think unions do play a very important role in that regard. Thank you. All right. So I think, Kasun, maybe you could have the final word here about C2's role in addressing some of the ethnic tensions in the country. <coughs> Uh, for that matter, I don't know as a farmer who. Um, uh, hmm? After the drug regime. Yes, at that time I'm not a trade unionist. <laughs> Only I'm, I heard the history, but I cannot give you the detail uh, about the as a farmer who bat. Regarding our uh, organization, we are working as a, uh, as, as a uh, national, not, uh, we are not following the government structure, we are not following the ethnicity, we are not following, we have only one language across the country. As I mentioned earlier, 
our uh, branch office is following the uh, geographical area. Whether you are Oromo, Amara, or uh, Gambela, whatever, we don't mind. If the workers are elected, you can be a leader. This is our principle. Uh, regarding the, the uh, ethnic issues, we, re we, we respect that because if the people are want to administer themselves uh, as a uh, region uh, like uh, Oromia, Amara, or Tigray, so we respect the, the government structure, but we are following our uh, principle. Uh, so this uh, uh, even to bring people together, we are doing a lot in our uh, different branches, also in Addis Ababa. But sometimes in our politics, it is difficult. If you say something, ah, you are from his, this ethnic group. That is why you are talking this. That's a that's a bad issue. But the structure of the federalism. Um, the attitude of the people, uh, you have to go there, you have to study what is the Ethiopian situation now, at the past, then after that you can uh, produce something for uh, policy or a structure. Without that, some people say this federalism is not good, this one you, unity is fine, um, ethnic federalism is not good. Geog geographical federalism is good, they are saying. So what is Ethiopian people need? For example, as workers, we need job. We need minimum wage to feed ourselves. Many youths are uh, waiting for a uh, job. Without creating a job, if you are a politician or whatever, you cannot bring stability. So uh, there is a lot of migration. Still today, people are migrate to other uh, countries. Then let me conclude. Uh, the responsibility uh, to stable the country, not only the new, the responsibility of new prime minister. All activities, all political parties, they said the government should do this, the government should do this. Who is the government? Only one person. Can you imagine? Can only one prime minister bring change in Ethiopia? He can't. So the responsibility is for all government uh, officials or political parties, whether they are opposition, whether they are ruling parties. Um, also the activists in our country, some of activists know my tribe or my ethnic group is defeat you. The other activists said, no, my uh, uh, ethnic uh, group is defeat you. This in social media. What are you doing when we are saying this? Is the constructive? Please, uh, you can uh, see this uh, direction. So the changes will be from all citizens. What is that? Is why we need to mobilize the uh, citizen or our family uh, in the home <coughs> to change their attitude. What is democracy? Democracy means not to uh, affect another ethnic group or another their individual. Yes, we believe in uh, human rights. Uh, so, uh, what is the democracy means to kill someone or to uh, insult someone, that is not more democracy for me. So, we need uh, to change the whole citizen, not the political uh, parties or uh, of it, uh, government officials. Uh, so, for us, we are, we do, it is difficult now in Ethiopia, uh, if you ask me uh, who you support, you are in favor of who you are uh, working, it's difficult to uh, elect one uh, political party because all of them, they are based on ethnicity. Ethnicity is not bad, but they didn't come with ideology. They based on ethnic. 
not on ideology. We, we want to change. That change is to get something better, not as before. If you came with new ideology, yes, I bring job, I bring this, this, I stable the, God, the country, if you say it, yes. Some of the political parties, they are national, but yes, they are doing the same thing with other ethnic uh, group. This is a problem. So we, we have to change as a citizen, as an organization, by mobilizing our community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Kasim, for, for closing us up. I'd like to thank all of our panelists for all their, their comments uh, and their energy and their work. And yeah, I want to... question for me. Uh, we're running out of time, unfortunately. Uh, we're going to um, we're have to close up, but it uh, shows how much discussion and engagement and interest there is that we can hope to continue the conversation another time. I want to quickly thank, too, uh, everyone at NED who helped put on this event, Carl and Zach, Aiden and Kaylee and everyone. So thank you very much.